Uh, thanks, Colin, very much. Um, thank you all uh, for coming along today. I, I know people are very busy with this pandemic and it's great um, to have people here. We won't keep you too long. Um, the whole session will last about an hour. Um, our plan is to um, show some videos, as Colin has mentioned. Um, they're all going to be available on our YouTube channel. So whereas the quality through Zoom can be a little bit suspect, uh, once you go on to the YouTube channel, you'll see with one exception, uh, which was recorded in the hospital, that the uh, videos are very watchable. And as Colin says, they're all very short. Um, I'm BMC. This is my first time doing organ donor awareness uh, launch. Uh, I've taken over from Mark. I'm delighted that Mark Murphy is on, on the call today. Mark, as you know, was CEO for over 20 years. Uh, so big shoes to fill, took over in October, and it's fair to say um, uh, it's been a bit of a whirlwind since. So delighted to be here today. And um, what we're going to be doing is uh, we have a video from the minister and uh, expressing his support, and we'll show that. Um, we have a number of short videos from both uh, people who've received uh, transplants uh, on all, all different organs, and from a donor family, and all of these videos are, are very short. We give a run through the campaign and an outline of it, and then we're delighted that Dr. Catherine Motherway uh, will also say a few words and just uh, give us the, the medical uh, perspective view on organ uh, donation. And there'll also be time at the end uh, for questions and answers. Um, so I know our chairperson was due to welcome you all, um, unfortunately, uh, he's been delayed. He seems to be having problems logging on. Um, so what I'd like to do is thank you all for your time today and uh, for coming. Uh, obviously, none of this would be happening uh, without our organ donor families. Um, and it's it's been amazing that even during the COVID pandemic, that organ donations <laughs> still continued. We've obviously lost an awful lot of people in both the commun kidney community and the broader organ transplant uh, community due to COVID, as we know they're very vulnerable. And we'd like to express our condolences um, to the families of those people. It's been a really very, very tough time um, for those people. Um, so Colin is still having uh, trouble logging on. So what we'll do at this point is um, we'll uh, go to the video um, which the Minister of His Health has put together in support of Organ Donor Awareness Week. Uh, so Robin, when you have a chance, if you could uh, show that video. Good morning. I'm privileged to have the opportunity to launch Organ Donor Awareness Week 2021. Given the challenges we all continue to face in staying safe during the COVID-19 pandemic, it's fitting that this important event is being launched online this year. Organ Donor Awareness Week represents an important opportunity each year to spread and to reinforce the message of the life-saving role played by organ donation and the enormous improvements in the quality of life it brings to recipients and to their families. I'm delighted, therefore, that the event is going ahead this year. Despite the challenges faced by everyone involved in organ donation and transplantation during these extraordinary times, I'm delighted that it's been possible to maintain organ donation and transplantation services throughout the pandemic. In 2020, a total of 156 transplants were carried out. 98 kidney transplants were performed at the National Renal Transplant Service, Beaumont Hospital. This figure included 77 deceased donor kidney transplants and 21 living kidney donor transplants. 32 liver transplants and four pancreas transplants were performed at the National Liver Transplant Service in St. Vincent's University Hospital. And 14 lung transplants and eight heart transplants were performed at the National Heart and Lung Transplant Service at the Matter Hospital. This is a great achievement. It's a testament to the professionalism and the dedication of all the intensive care staff, procurement staff, surgical teams, medical teams, and nursing teams. In particular, I want to acknowledge the great work of all the staff in organ donation and transplant Ireland, the three transplant centres, and the intensive care staff in our hospitals. 
I want to thank the organ donation nurse managers who are working tirelessly on the ground in each of the hospital groups, promoting the benefits that organ donation brings to recipients and building enthusiasm among the hospital teams for organ donation. I'd like to thank the staff working in intensive care units in hospitals across the country for the incredible work that they're doing in treating our COVID patients <laughs> and also for the important role they play in the transplant process. Their initial contact with families in the most difficult of circumstances is an essential part of the donation process. Of course, without the generosity of the families who selflessly agree to the donation of their loved one's organs, organ transplantation could not happen. Their support for the donation process is truly an act of altruism which takes place without reward, without recognition, except for the comfort they take from the thought that their loved one's last act was to save the life of others. To all of you, I extend my sincere thanks. I understand that Derry and Sally Ann Clark will be sharing their donation story with you later today. Thank you for your generosity in sharing the gift of life with others at a time of immense sadness for your family. I also want to thank the other participants who are sharing their organ transplant stories with you here today. I hope that their personal testimony about the emotional roller coaster of being on an organ transplant waiting list and the transformative effect receiving an organ transplant had on their lives will encourage others to become organ donors. I want to particularly thank the donors of the Living Kidney Programme for their huge generosity in giving the opportunity for life-changing transplantation to recipients. The positive impact that organ transplantation can have on the life of a recipient and the lives of those around them cannot be overstated. We all have a duty to do everything we can to ensure that as many people as possible benefit from organ donation. As Minister for Health, I am committed to building on the continued progress we have achieved in the area of organ donation and transplantation. I want to ensure that Ireland ranks amongst the most successful countries in terms of the proportion of the population who donate organs, the number of recipients who benefit from these donations, and the subsequent improvement in the quality of life of organ recipients. My department continues to work with Organ Donation and Transplant Ireland, intensive care staff, and the transplant hospitals to build upon the achievements of recent years. Incremental improvements to our organ procurement service will continue to be achieved through improved infrastructure in ICUs, implementing a more robust organ retrieval service, and through transplant centres, maximising the conversion rates from donor opportunities that are presented. Additional funding of three quarters of a million euro is being provided this year to support this ongoing development and improvement in our organ donation and transplant services. The funding will ensure that our organ donation services are equipped to meet expected additional demands following the introduction of an opt-out system of organ donation as part of the Human Tissue Bill, the enactment of which is a priority for this government. The legislation will be accompanied by a publicity campaign aiming to raise awareness of organ donation and to encourage people to make a decision that they wish to become an organ donor and to share that decision with their loved ones. Ultimately, the aim is to make organ donation the norm for people in this country. I want to thank Colm McKenzie as chairman and the recently appointed Carol Moore as CEO who took over from Mark Murphy in 2020 after 20 years in the role, and all their colleagues in the Irish Kidney Association, who have been at the forefront in promoting organ donor awareness. Thank you also to all organ donation and transplantation support groups for your unstinting work in supporting individuals and their families, including the Irish Donor Network. Organ donation is among the most selfless acts we can bestow upon another person. I would ask that during Organ Donation Awareness Week, everyone would consider becoming an organ donor 
and just as importantly, sharing this intention with their loved ones. In this way, we can increase the possibility that on one's death, your organs may be used to give someone the opportunity of life and that loved ones will have the comfort of knowing that your wishes were carried through. In conclusion, I reiterate my commitment to work to increase organ donation and transplantation rates to the benefit of patients and their families. I wish Organ Donor Awareness Week every success and want to thank everyone involved for your efforts in making this week possible. With the continued successful rollout of the vaccination program, there are better days ahead for all of us. If all of us share our intention with our families to pass on the gift of life, there will be better days ahead for those waiting for organ transplant also. Thank you. Hi, well, that was a great vote of support from the minister. Um, he was also launching quarantine hotels um, today and uh, obviously one of the busiest ministers trying to run a department that seems to be involved in absolutely everything to do with life. So we really appreciate the minister taking the time to record the video and express his support for organ donation and his commitment to prioritising uh, the human tissues bill and bringing in that uh, additional funding, which is very, very welcome. So thank you to the minister. So the next video I'd like to show um, is just a short video. Uh, it's um, about uh, six minutes long, and it basically just gives a snapshot of some of the stories of transplant uh, recipients. Uh, so if you'd like to share that now, Robin, please. My name is Siobhan, I am 38 years old. I'm from Cavan. In 2020, I had a simultaneous pancreas kidney transplant in St Vincent Hospital. Well, up until transplant, I was a diabetic. And in 2012, I picked up an E. coli infection during some travel to India for work. I started to find the impact of that infection fairly quickly. Um, and I was diagnosed with kidney failure in 2014. So after about two years on dialysis, my treatment began to deteriorate and I struggled with the consequences. Living with organ failure is hard, but there is hope. I always felt that while one part of my life wasn't exactly easy, it didn't have to have an impact on every part of my life. There's always joy to be found in life. You just have to accept the hardships and try and make peace with them. When I think about my donor and my organ donor family, it's with an outpouring of love and gratitude from the very depths of my soul. And I can only hope that some of that sentiment reaches their own hearts. And I, I like to think of my dad and my donor hugging it out in heaven as I would hope to at some stage. Death is a tragic thing. We all have to face it. I have and I will again. But if you can leave the legacy of giving someone a life back who otherwise would have lost theirs, then regardless of anything else, that will have been a life well lived. Um, it was when I was in sixth year studying for my leaving cert, the GP noticed that I had uh, quite high blood pressure. Um, so because I was otherwise quite well and, you know, probably stressed studying and things, they just thought it was falsely elevated that time. Um, but then the leaving cert came and went and still I just was really tired. Um, the blood pressure was still up and I was just kind of, just quite unwell, getting lots of little infections. Um, and. Yeah, energy was very low so I went back to the GP then um, in 2013 and um, when I mentioned that my dad had had two kidney transplants and the first when he was just 23 uh, the GP started to think that this could be what was going on. So it was a C3 glomerulonephritis um, and it was a genetic um, disease that I'd inherited then from my dad um, and yeah so I, I had to kind of go on to dialysis and, and um, on to the transplant list. I received the kidney in 2017, so that was three and a half years ago. Then post-transplant, it took a few weeks for me. It was kind of um, 
quite a slow start but then it just felt like I turned a corner and I just felt like I could do anything again. I guess I felt like someone in their 20s for the first time. I'm Thomas Caffrey, I'm 21 years old and when I was 17 I was diagnosed with primary sclerosis and cholangitis and in 2020 I had a liver transplant. I wasn't as like down about it as you thought. I was kind of, I was young so I kind of always tried to look at the brighter side of it um, but obviously being told that you're more than likely going to need a liver transplant is, is kind of hard for anyone to hear. When I, when I found out there was a, a liver there waiting for me in Dublin, I was just, I was just so excited because I knew it was, the, it was the beginning of the end of all this. I, I knew I was going to get to the other side of it through this and I'm just so grateful for the, the chance that I got, even though it was in sad circumstances, it has given me a new lease of life and I'm, I'm grateful to my donor and, its fa and their family. I was diagnosed with alpha-1 antitrypsin in 2010. When I was told I needed a double lung transplant, um, I was sort of in shock, didn't know what to expect, like, and I was asking myself, why did this happen to me, like, and I was healthy all my life, like, and training, doing everything, like, keep myself healthy, fit, and then when you're told these words, like, when I was on the transplant list, um, I had eight false calls, like, potential donors were were available like and that so eight times I was up ready for tear but unfortunately the lungs didn't suit or they suited somebody else but in November 2013 my night call uh, that night I got my double lung transplant. My favourite saying is um, my organ donor is my favourite person like they're my hero. I presented to hospital on January 2020 with swollen legs and I was finding it very hard to breathe. Um, with that then, I discovered I needed a heart transplant. Before all this happened, um, I never really gave organ donation a second thought really. Like, But now I understand the importance of it. And I urge each and everyone um, to donate their organs if they can. My family, friends, everyone does it now. It does a massive. They all are so aware of the importance of this. They say life begins at 40, and for me that really is the case. And I intend to live every day as best as I can. I'm delighted that my mum made it through it and that she got a heart and all that. I'm just delighted. Right, so as you can see, that's a, a short uh, snippet of the videos on the full versions of the videos are, are on, on the website. Um, and I think it, what you can see there is just such a broad representation of uh, people uh, in those snippets. And people who need organs come from all walks of life. And uh, even Denise, you saw she never knew anything about organ donation. It was total shock to her uh, when she realized she actually needed a heart transplant. Um, so you can ha have a look at those videos on the website at the leisure. I know through Zoom they don't come through as good as uh, they can be, um, but hopefully um, you can have a quick look afterwards. So next I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Um, Catherine Motherway to say a few words. Uh, Catherine is a leading uh, medical consultant working in the intensive care unit uh, in Limerick, and she's a past president of the Intensive Care Society of Ireland and has been a very articulate and, and forceful proponent of organ donation. So over to you, Catherine. Thank you very much, Carol. So, I mean, this week we come together in a virtual way, unfortunately, because of the difficulties we've had over the last year to try and promote and to continue to promote the awareness of organ donation. And as Carol has said, I work in the intensive care unit in Limerick, where we attempt to save every life that comes into us. But obviously, um, there are times when that can't happen. And the gift of life and the gift of an organ for recipients we've just seen from that video is so life changing and life altering. For me, on behalf of the intensive care community, Organ Donation Transplant Ireland, whom I work with as a clinical lead in organ donation, and also the transplant community, I always think every time this year comes of our deceased donors and their families. I work with these families. I, I, I try and save the life of their relatives. 
And when I meet them to tell them and give them bad news, I am all so humbled every time if I ask them would their loved one have wanted to be into an organ donor, that when they say yes, it's always humbling. It is truly um, amazing that people can do this in, you know, in, in very tragic circumstances it, with the sudden loss of life and in their loved one, that people can actually do this. And, and generally we find usually they've had a conversation, uh, you know, with um, their family at some point in time, and usually they know what their loved one would have wanted. And it's our job in the ICU community to try and ensure that their loved one's wishes would have been honored. And we attempt to um, honor those wishes. We would be really always thinking about them every year when the organ donation mass occurs. We um, remember them with gratitude. We thank them for their gift. And I often quote a Kristen Scheel, which is a hymn that I used to, uh, that I'm very fond of. And it's Oosh Kreek, Ni Kreek Ak Oosh. And it's from, you know, it's, it's a wonderful notion that in, at a time of death and such loss, that people can give life. And for the families of those donors, we thank them. And we hope that this gift that they have given will give them some comfort um, as they remember their loved ones, particularly for the last 12 months, which has been very difficult for bereaved families. So all I can say is reiterate our gratitude to those people to encourage everybody to have that conversation so that when somebody like me, unfortunately, comes and gives you bad news and then asks you a question about organization and what they'd wanted, that you will that they will you will have let them know what you wanted and they will do what you wanted, as they always do. So that's about it, Carl, really. I mean, I can say no more other than thank people um, for their gift, um, which has benefited many of us, many of us have relatives who have our, who are transplant recipients. And um, it is truly humbling to work in the circumstances that we, we do work and have done for the last 12 months and to continue to support organ donation. And that opportunity for families, if they should wish to take it, is really, really, really important. Thanks very much, Catherine. Um, and it shows the, the dedication and commitment of people working in this area because Catherine is actually on her holidays, but agreed to come in off her holidays to be here with us today. And without the de dedication of healthcare professionals like Catherine and her many colleagues, you know, this life saving surgery just wouldn't be happening. And uh, we're delighted you're here with us today. And I'm even more delighted that the Wi Fi, because I know the Wi Fi in your area is very <laughs> illegal, actually managed to hold up. So thanks for being here. Pass on our thanks to all your healthcare uh, colleagues as well who work so hard uh, on our behalf and who are just so very, very dedicated. We're very lucky uh, to have you. So thank you yeah. very much for that. And it's important that people should realize that when, when, when people say yes to us, we, we are so, 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 so grateful. And we do our level best at all levels to ensure that their wishes are honored and that we ensure that um, organ donation proceeds and transplantation occurs. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Katja. Great. Okay, well, what we're going to do next is actually um, just do a quick uh, campaign overview. So I'm just going to share my own screen now. I'll just take a few. Okay, so hopefully we should be in full uh, slide view. Um, we'll go through it now. Great. So obviously we couldn't run our traditional campaign due to COVID-19 um, last year. And you know there is an ongoing need to maintain organ donor awareness on an ongoing basis because we've got to keep um, the issue live amongst um, the general population. Obviously, we couldn't run a physical event uh, this year uh, because of COVID. So what we've gone for is a lot of online activity with an outdoor element. So the key theme of the campaign is life is a gift, pass it on. And you can see from this poster here that what we've done is we've brought together uh, a number of recipients of, our, of organ transplants, ranging from kidneys to heart, lungs, pancreas, all the various different organs. And as you can see, they come from a wide range of backgrounds and a wide range of sectors. 
And thanks to the Irish Pharmaceutical Union, we were able to get that out to all 1,850 pharmacies got an undated uh, copy of this. And uh, they also did a feature in the IPU magazine because uh, Gina there, she has actually uh, received a heart transplant. And as you can see on this particular version of the poster, there's 32 transplant recipients enjoying over 400 years of extra life thanks to organ donation. So it's great that all of these people agreed to have their, their photograph uh, featured. And thanks to our volunteers, we've got an Irish version of the poster as well, which is terrific. And again, thanks to one of our transplant recipients uh, who uh, is Polish. We had a group of volunteers who did the Polish translation and the Polish embassy actually worked with us to get this poster and communications out to the Polish community. And then thanks to Clear Channel, we got some free advertising and it's appearing, um, this particular version is appearing in shopping centers all around the country about 30 different uh, shopping centers, so you can keep an eye out for them. And then for City, you can see is featuring the poster and a number of their scenes during Organ uh, Donor Awareness Week. You can see it in the background there, so lots of good product placement, as they call it. And then uh, we have over 60 public buildings uh, lit up. This one is uh, of a picture in uh, St. Mary's Church in, in Wexford, uh, so that's great. And why do we go for green? Well, green is the internationally recognized color which celebrates organ and tissue donation. It symbolizes hope and rebirth. And patients on the transplant waiting list, they live in hope that organs will become available to them. And while there's hope, it's also a difficult time as their future is uncertain and they know another family is grieving the loss of a loved one. And by lighting up the public sites in green, which is the international, uh, the national color of Ireland, we're drawing attention to the fact that organ donation, it's an integral part of active citizenship. That's the link that uh, we want to create. So we kicked this off in St. Patrick's Day. Uh, we put together a video of people from all over the world, New Zealand, Australia, Malaysia, the UK. And basically they uh, stated that life is a gift, uh, pass it on. And that's also on our YouTube channel. And then we have a range of videos. Um, we have a celebrity chain video, which I'm going to show you in a minute. Uh, you've seen the trailer video. And then a range of personal interest stories from uh, different people. And also from Jerry and Sally Ann Clark. And Jarlett Regan has recorded a podcast with Vivian Trainer, And that's going to go live during uh, Awareness Week. So I'll hand over to Robin now, who hopefully is going to show you the uh, celebrity chain video. Hi, I'm Angeline. In 2014, my lovely niece Saoirse's life was saved by a liver transplant. Life is the best gift that you could ever give to someone. So become a donor. Life is a gift. Pass it on. Thank you. Please, please, please carry a donor card and have the chat with your family. Life is a gift. Pass it on. Hi, I'm Vivian Trainer, and I'm a living kidney donor. Once again this year, I'm supporting Organ Donor Awareness Week. Life is a gift. Pass it on. My name is Jarlath Regan, and four years ago I gave my brother a kidney. And honestly, it's the best thing I've ever done. Life is a gift. Pass it on. Hi, I'm Jerry Clark. And hello, I'm Sally Ann. And we were honoured to be able to fulfil our son Andrew's wishes by donating his organs. Life is a gift. Pass it on. Hello, Mary Kennedy here. I know and love so many people whose lives have been touched by organ donation. Life is a gift. Pass it on. So that's one example of just one of the videos that we're um, making uh, available to people on our, our channel and we'll be promoting on our social media. So um, if my screen unfreezes, I'll continue on with the uh, rest of the campaign. 
So on the social media, what we're asking people to do and all our volunteers is to hold, basically hold the donor card in front of you and take a picture. Try to have the photograph taken close enough so people can see that it is a donor card you're holding. And then to actually post the photograph on social media. Um, we've given an example of a post so you can say, life is a gift. I'm saying yes to organ donation. And I'm asking three of my friends to do the same and that you would tag three of your friends with a number of uh, different um, tags, life is a gift and donor week 21. Um, anybody that tags us, they'll be entered into a raffle to win one of a hundred branded uh, face masks. So what we're trying to do, because we can't do the physical activity, is to actually uh, create um, a lot of social media activity online and generate awareness that way. And then we have a dedicated website page where the posters can be downloaded. Uh, there's a school toolkit, all the videos are there and the photographs are there. And the Zoom background that uh, you can see behind me, there's a lot of interest in that already. That's been uh, downloaded as well. So it's all about trying to create active uh, engagement. Um, our branches are involved. It's essential. Um, we've always uh, adopted a very community folks approaching this. So they'll be checking the display in the pharmacies. Um, they'll be checking that green buildings are lit and taking photographs encouraging local and national media support, whether that's broadcast, print or online, sharing on social media, encouraging the schools to download education pack and in particular the transition years, and then encouraging individually and socially distanced activities that promote organ donation. So for example, the Sligo branch are actually doing a swimming challenge uh, during Organ Donor Awareness Week. So to conclude, basically what we're trying to do is raise awareness. We've upgraded the organ donor uh, app, app so people, when they download that, they can share their wishes very easily using any number of social media channels, uh, be it text, WhatsApp, email. Uh, they can use them all, making it very easy for people to raise awareness. Or if they're not into the technology, that they can just free text donor to 50050. And the key thing is about sharing your wishes. So that's basically um, an outline of the campaign and all the work uh, that we'll be doing um, throughout the week to generate interest and activity and to get basically the community talking about organ donor awareness. And one of the interesting things we're getting on feedback is that um, lots of people are being very positive about it because this is a very positive act uh, to actually share your wishes about organ donation. And it's great in a time where we've had so much bad news to actually be doing something positive. Um, that people can uh, participate in. So that's uh, on the campaign. So the next video we're going to show, the quality won't be as good because it's actually um, from Ian. And unfortunately, Ian has been in hospital, the matter hospital, um, since last July, and he's waiting on a heart transplant. So we'll be hearing um, from Ian and a friend of his. So Robin, if you'd like to um, uh, hit the button on that. Hi, my name is Ian Doherty. I'm 46 years of age. I'm from Limerick. Uh, I'm on waiting heart transplant here in the matter hospital in the CCU ward. Um, I've been here just over eight months. Plus the COVID situation, idea is, is not helping. Um, just briefly, I just want to tell my story in a short few minutes. Um, I was born with a procedure called the Muscle Procedure, uh, transposition of the greater arteries. I was six months old and um, I had to get it done in Brompton, in England. Uh, then when I came home, I just lived my life, carried on as normal. And then I started to get sick when, when I was about 26. And then from there on, I've been coming up to the matter for the last 18 years or so. Dr. Kevin Wallace and Rona. Um, I had two pacemakers for this, and an ICD for this, and uh, at this stage now, um, my heart has actually come to its end, and now I'm at the stage I can't survive without these machines. It's not an easy road, it's a very, very tough road, and I just want people to realise out there. Uh, waiting for a kidney or a lung or a heart transplant, it's not straightforward as people may think. 
there's a lot of, lot of detail and a lot of hardship. And not only yourself do you suffer, your family suffer as well with the worry. So Ian has been here in the Mater Hospital since last June, so it's been quite a long road for us. Um, he deteriorated quite progressively at that stage. Um, at, the, at that point in time, we were told that we could be looking at palliative care. We didn't know whether he would be a suitable donor or not for a transplant. So he went through rigorous tests um, and thankfully he was put on the list in August. He's had two workups since then, um, which has been really very difficult for him. Um, building yourself up for it and it's, it's been a very difficult time. Christmas was the last time I saw my daughter. It took five weeks before I could see her. And you only get to see her once a week for a few hours. As I said, been stuck in here, you're in a little room, 24-7. You know, it's very lonely, very lonely. <coughs> I miss my daughter so much. <coughs> <clears throat> miss my dog, miss my own surroundings, miss my own comforts. You know, they do their utmost best to make us comfortable and feel safe in here. Doctors, credible. I've had my ups and downs, I've had bad days. It is mentally, mentally hard. You pull yourself up, you get knocked down. You pull yourself up, you get knocked down. You have to keep going. You have to just keep going. I keep telling myself, if I waste a year in here of waiting for a heart, well, please God, I gain 20, 30 years of a new life with my daughter and my family, my dog. And do the things that you took for granted and you wouldn't do. Uh, we all take life for granted, even the small little things. Trust me, you should appreciate every, everything, every day. So, I just want to end it at that. I've had two work ups for a heart, but they weren't a suitable match. It's so tense, so nerve-wracking. You know, and you think that's it, you're looking forward to getting on the other side and getting better. And then bang. So hopefully, please God, third time lucky. Please God, uh, there's a heart out there just for me and for everyone. So thank you very much for listening to my story. Take care. I've seen that video a couple of times. And every time I see it, you can see, you know, it's just so tough for Ian. And there's so many Ians who are waiting, you know, on a on, um, heart. And so difficult for them because they know somebody, you know, particularly, in, 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 you know, somebody has to die for them to live. But really, this is what this campaign is about. Um, it's about helping people like Ian. And, you know, even if one person, um, gets a transplant as a result of the work that we're doing for us, it will um, be worthwhile. So it's very hard um, to listen to that and very hard for people to listen to that, but it's just so important people are aware of the gift of life that they can give. So um, our final video is um, from a really wonderful uh, couple. Some of you will have spoken to them already, but they've kindly participated in the video, um, Sally-Ann and Jerry Clark, 
and they put their thoughts down. And I think it, it's actually a very inspiring video. So Robin, if you'd like to show this video now. Andrew, um, our darling Andrew, he was 16 when he died. He was um, six foot, five and a half, built like a tank, larger than life, always had a smile on his face, was always the life and soul of the party. He was car mad. Um, as I say, we bought him his first action man bike, you know, the little electric ones when he was about three. And it went from there. He did biking, quad biking, and then he moved on to motorsports. And um, he was even clever enough. He went up north and got his own, applied for his own license at 13 because you couldn't do it in, in the Republic until you were 14. So he had it. He was way ahead and he was always... Um, always thinking, always fixing things, always... He was, yeah. He was, he was a great man, though, at uh, dismantling engines, but not putting them back together again, you know? Um, but he used to go, as I said, we'd, um, most weekends, I... Um, the guy's never involved in motorsport. I had no interest in it. But um, obviously, you know, you have uh, a son or a daughter that has interest in something, or hobby, you're going to support that. So we did, and we went with lots of travelling around, around England and Ireland, uh, racing, different, various different types of cars. Um, expensive in sport, I found out pretty quickly. <laughs> but um, but well, a you very, got sponsorship, didn't you? You did, got sponsorship. Yeah, okay. um, us. <laughs> but um, it was a great, great time, it was great, great memories. And I'm glad that happened actually, because that gave me something, you know, connection with him. Um, but Sally Ann said he was very well liked. He did make an impact everywhere he went. Um, he was good at what he did. He had that, that hobby was a bit, so the only hobby really was that, and a bit of rugby maybe. Yeah, he played rugby yeah. and he sailed. He liked to sail during the yeah, summer. Yeah, and then he, he spent time with me. We have a boat, and he spent time. We go here and there, like Scotland or England or around yeah. Ireland. Yeah, he loved the boat, and so, that was precious time for you too. It was. As well. It was great because I would take a bit longer here in the summer then, you know, when he got that age. And Sarah May would join us, her, her daughter, which is important now, you know, at this age. My mom had been ill months before Andrew died, and actually he babysat her the Saturday night before he died. And um, she'd been talking about her funeral. And where Andrew went to school, they used to do a mass every Sunday morning. All the boys would be in their uniform. And one of the songs they would sing at the end of mass was Glory, Glory, Hallelujah. And my mom used to say, I want that played at my funeral. And I want to be buried. And I want, you know, a nice dark wood coffin. And I want, and I want. And um, obviously Andrew would be in the car with us. And he said, I love that song too, mom. And I want to be buried. And they discussed organ transplant and organ donation in school. And we both have organ donor cards. And um, uh, my mom's pal had um, decreed that she was donating her whole body for medical science. And my mom was saying, well, if I've got anything that's any use to anybody. And Andrew said, well, my mom and dad are going to donate. I'm going to be an organ donor. I'd like to pass on, you know, um, if there's anything any good to anybody else. So. In retrospect, we'd had all the conversations months and months before he died. So we knew, mm. you know, how he felt. We knew that he was, mm. as soon as he got to of age, he wanted his own donor card. And uh, we knew a lot of the things that he'd, you know, because we discussed them with my mom. Now, thankfully, my mom is still here. Um, and thank God she's hale and hearty. But um, we, we knew a lot of the things that he would wish in the event of him dying. Yeah, looking back yeah. now, when you look, um, you know, what's happened to us, those conversations may be difficult, but sometimes I think families should have them, really, because we, we aren't here forever, no. you know, We're and, here uh, for a long time. and really, you know, I, I do have friends who are transplant recipients, and um, I know how their life has changed receiving an organ, it really has changed them, um, it's made a, a really positive life for them, and uh, I think it's something, and also, you know, some, some part of your uh, son of our son, um, lives on, which is a bit, in a way, I look at it that way, you know, um, definitely um, Andrew did help at least three people. Mm. Um, of course, I don't know who they are, no. and that's the way it should be, really. Mm. I think it's best to have it that way, yeah, be anonymous. And, uh, and, you know, for us to be able to do that for somebody, mm. um, you know, I mean, it's, it, as Derry said, it's a little piece of him is still living on, and he was always a giver. He was always somebody that would give freely of his time. He'd give you his last euro, mm. he'd, wouldn't he? He'd, he'd well, yeah, he had a very positive thing about him was he protected the weakest, mm. always. Like, he's in boarding school. So any of the new boys arriving in, in their first year, first term, he was the one, and we found this out afterwards, would go down to their dorms and uh, nurture them and 
say I'm here, I need help. Because it's difficult the first few days. Yeah. So he was the one that did that, that a lot. First few months, we got so yeah. many letters after he yeah, died. From kids saying he from was the one. kids saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was the one who helped them. He and was he, the one who was there. He did it quietly. Was, I never knew about it. I mean, I never knew about it. So yeah. he did something. That was something he did himself, mm. which is very impressive, I think. Mm. Really, yeah. Yeah, no, he was a yeah. wonderful child. And we were very lucky to have him for as long as we did. It's eight years ago now. Obviously, we miss him every day. But, yeah. you know, to, to think again that there's a little bit of him living on yeah. and that he has given the gift of life to all these people is just amazing. Like, we knew that Andrew wanted to um, donate his organs. We knew that. So that made a big difference. So we told our doctor that, and then he passed it on. But um, we hadn't known that. I don't think, you know, we hadn't talked about it. We hadn't talked. Well, we wouldn't if know. we hadn't talked about it. Yes, exactly. Yeah, if we hadn't yeah. talked about it, we wouldn't know. Yeah. So I think um, all families should maybe just, it's something um, that's positive to do. Mm-hmm. Because you're, when you're, 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 yeah. Sorry, um, your legacy is living on. Yeah. But when you're in that situation where your loved one is about to pass or is brain dead or whatever, it's very difficult to think that mm-hmm. their their organs might be of use to somebody else. You're not in the zone, are you? Uh, no, you you're not you don't that think way. clearly, yeah. you don't think whatever. And of course, once they die, it's too late. So I think it's something, as, as you said, that every family should have the conversation and that every family should say, well, look, you know, in the event. So I have everything written down. And I know what you want as well. So there will be no, there'll be no problems in that regard. And our daughter knows exactly what we want. But um, we're grateful that we had the conversation, aren't we? Yeah, no, sure. Yeah. It just made it, it made very it, easy. It made it simpler. Hmm. So thanks to um, Sally Ann and Jerry. Um, they really have done so much Trojan work in support of organ donation. And you can see one of the big um, benefits of, of being allowing organ donation that, you know, at a very dark time, it shines a light. You know, it has obviously given them a lot of comfort. Obviously, it's never going to replace um, their son, Andrew. But it has given them an awful lot of comfort, the fact that they've been able uh, to help others. So, you know, it really is very inspiring, very impassioned. Um, uh, inspiring, very courageous um, what they have done. So what, what this week is about, it's all about uh, encouraging people to have that chat, to have that conversation. As you saw, it made such a difference um, to Sally Ann and Jerry that they'd actually had that conversation with Andrew. So they knew um, that Andrew wanted his organs donated. And obviously they never thought it was ever going, that they would actually be making that decision. Uh, with the doctors but you know as Ian says we we just don't know what's ahead of us we don't know it could be me walking out in the front of a bus tomorrow you know we just don't know so that's why it's so important to um to have that conversation so that our loved ones know that uh we want our organs to be used in the event um it's, it's possible or we die uh suddenly in a hospital um, so that's really um, all we wanted um, to show you. And at this stage, we're going to open it up and see if there's any questions um, that people want to ask at this point. We probably traumatized you all with all those videos, but they are very moving. And I think they do show the reality of um, what people are up against. And, um, I see Philip Walsh uh, has commented, and thanks, Philip, that um, um, he appreciates the videos and wanted to thank us all and to Mark as well, and thinking of some of the people that have passed away uh, throughout the year, um, some very uh, well-known people like Terry Mangan um, passed away. So thanks for that, um, Philip. Are there any other questions that uh, people want to ask? We've a thanks in uh, from a few people, just saying thank you. So thanks for that. Okay, well, just to say, um, all the resources are on our YouTube, YouTube channel. Uh, the videos are on our YouTube channel. You can find the link to it uh, from our um, special website page on the IK website. There's a full range of resources for the media as well. Um, on um, the website page as well. Um, so um, it's www.ikadonorweek.ie. 
2021. So if you go that, down there, you'll find all the resources that you can use um, to have the chat, share your wishes, um, stories, the stories of the people and photographs of the people that are involved. So we'd really appreciate your support in actually sharing the news and sharing the information. Okay. So thanks very much to everybody for attending and giving us your valuable time. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I'm Colin McKenzie, uh, Chairperson of the Irish Kidney Association. I would like to thank all the special people and their families uh, who you've heard so much about now to don who donate. And it's, it's a gift that no words of mine or anybody's words could adequately describe. The sacrifice, the generosity, the empathy, whatever term, adjective you, you want to use, it's just incredible. And if we ever lose faith in humanity, just think of the donor families. Uh, I'd like to mention also uh, the transplant teams who carry out the transplants. They're wonderful people, dedicated people, and their skills make all this possible. And I'd like to mention all the organizations that support uh, organ donation. Uh, I'm thinking apart from ourselves, obviously, I'm thinking of the HSE and the ODTI, Organ Donation Transplant Ireland. And while I'm saying that, I, I'd like to thank Catherine, Catherine Motherway for coming and speaking to us uh, in your valuable time out of your break. Thank you very much, Catherine. And, um, but also uh, there's the Cystic Fibrosis Ireland and the Irish Heart and Lung Transplant Association and all who support transplantation. Um, it's been a tough time for everybody involved because the COVID has made it tough. It's made it hard and it's made it particularly hard for people on dialysis and people who have been transplanted who are more vulnerable uh, than most. And it's been very difficult. And they also, they of course been supported by our dedicated, courageous hospital staff. And when we mention hospital staff, it's terribly important not to just think of the frontline people, which we are in awe of, of course, doctors and nurses, but also all the people involved in a hospital who are exposed to COVID in one way or another, whether it's the people who prepare the meals, the cleaners, the security men, the, the, uh, the people who work in the background, there's a huge number of people work in the hospitals behind the scenes. And as far as I'm concerned, they're all heroes at this difficult and, and challenging time that we're facing. Um, and finally, also, I'd like to offer my condolences to all the people who've lost loved ones this year because it's been a difficult time. And all I can say to you is, and, and thank the minister for speaking to us so eloquently about everything. And But I would just like to say to you all, take care and look after yourselves because we're the, the, I, I suppose the battle isn't over yet, but we're still uh, doing the best we can. And thank you for your support and uh, coming here and tuning in to uh, support the launch of our Organ Donor Week. And I wish you all the very best and thank you very much.